Well, I'm so glad we are in the presence of the Lord. So let's look to him as we always do, to hear from his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your goodness to us. We thank you that your word tells us that goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And we are so privileged to know you as our God, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. Lord, we thank you for preserving your word for us. And I pray today that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts to hear what you have for us today. Thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior and our King. We pray today that your Holy Spirit will take what is of Christ and make it known to our hearts. These things we pray with thanksgiving in the precious name of Jesus Christ as I submit myself to the authority of your Spirit to speak through me for the glory of his name that is above every other name. And all God's people said, Amen. Our well, pastor and lecturer Thomas DeWitt Talmage, who lived 1832 to 1902, told the story of a, an accident that occurred on a ferry on one of the Great Lakes. Maybe you have been on the Great Lakes before. A little child standing by the rail suddenly lost her balance and fell overboard. Save my child, cried the frantic mother, and I know some of you here will do the same. Lying on the deck was a great Newfoundland dog, Newfoundland dog, which plunged into the water at the command of his master. Swimming to the girl, he took hold of her he took hold of her clothing with his teeth and brought her to the side of the boat where both were lifted to safety. Although still frightened, the little girl threw her arms around the big shaggy dog and kissed him again and again. It seemed a most natural and appropriate thing to do in that situation, because the dog saved her life. Well, likewise, a response of love and gratitude should flow from every person who has been rescued by Jesus Christ the Savior through his self-sacrificing death on the cross, which we celebrated uh, just a week ago on Easter. He came from heaven's glory to suffer and die, that we might have what? Eternal life. A life we could never have had, had he not willingly and voluntarily pulled us out from the cesspool of sin and the slave market of sin and brought us to safety, even as the little girl was pulled out of the waters of the great lakes and brought to safety. Without Jesus' coming, you know, and I know, that we will have all drowned in the cesspool of sin and be forever separated from the loving presence of the loving God. So this brings me to the main idea of the message God has given me today from his word to deliver to you at this special hour in your life and my life. So please, I want you to listen carefully to it, not just with your head, but more importantly with your heart, where the Holy Spirit is willing and waiting to plant the seed of God's faithful and fruitful truth. In order to do what? In order to change genuine born-again believers among us here today more into the blessed likeness of Jesus Christ, who is the supreme example of suffering and sacrifice, and to convict unbelievers of their sin of unbelief mercifully and miraculously leading them to genuine repentance and personal saving faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, of lost sinners, of whom I am the chief. So here is our message in a nutshell. Please, I want you to pay close attention to it with an open heart and an open mind, willing to accept it and I hear to it. Well, here is the message in a nutshell. The chief reason for the first coming of Jesus Christ 
is to deal decisively with our sin problem so that believers, so that true believers can be overcomers of sin by remaining in him. I repeat, the chief reason for Jesus' first coming is to deal decisively with our sin problem so that true believers can be overcomers of sin by remaining or continuing in him. Folks, friends, faithful followers of Christ among us here today and fellow believers in the fold and flock, fellowship and family of God, the Bible is going to strongly and specifically show us that our present likeness to Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, places us in a position of incompatibility with sin. Because sin is contrary to the person and work of Jesus Christ, as we are going to see clearly today. The verses we are going to study today deal with the Christian's incompatibility with sin. You see, the false teachers John combated who were corrupting the fundamentals of the faith totally, listen, discounted the significance of sin and the need for obedience. They viewed matter, that is something like this, is matter, as inherently bad or evil. And as a result, any sins committed in the physical realm is considered as irrelevant, insignificant, or unimportant. John will tell these false teachers that their view, however fervently and firmly held, is not consistent with God's view of sin. He takes sin seriously, and that is the very reason he sent Jesus Christ into the world to deal with your sin problem and my sin problem. So please, if you have, if you have your Bibles, keep tend them, but before that, you see John was very concerned that Christians know how to tell the true from the false, how to tell the genuine from the artificial and how to tell true believers from false believers. As such, he presents to us here and throughout his letter to help us determine the validity of anybody's claim to be a Christian. Can you determine the validity of someone's claim to be a Christian? On what would you base that? Well, John has been giving us how to de determine the validity of someone's claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ. In the passage we are about to study, the Bible will simply but significantly spell out to us that a true, genuine, born-again Christian is not, listen, a habitual sinner. But the person who continues in sin is far removed from being saved. In fact, such a person whose life is characterized by habitual, constant sinning has neither seen Christ nor has known him. So please, if you have your Bibles, would you please turn them to 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 to 6. Would you please listen carefully as I recite our passage of study from the updated New American Standard Bible which is the most literal translation of our Bible into our English language. Uh, for the sake of context, I'll be reciting from the very first verse of chapter 3. The Bible says what? See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we will be called children of God. And such we are. For this reason, the world does not, does not know us. Because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not, it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Because we will see him just as he is. 
and everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Then verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. You know he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. This is the word of God to the people of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the recital of his holy word. Well, we have a passage of study which can be accurately described as a passage of stark contrast. First of all, it is a passage of stark contrast because it presents a stark contrast between the practicing or habitual sinner and the perfect Son of God who is sinless. We'll see that today. These are two contrasting characters in our passage of study. Second, it is a passage of stark contrast because it portrays a stark contrast between the true believers and the false ones. Remember I mentioned earlier that John was very concerned that Christians know how to tell the true from the false. Well, the six, which ends our passage of study today, portrays a stark contrast between the true from the false. Literally, it says, everyone remaining in him sins not. That represents true believers. And then it goes on, everyone sinning has not seen him, nor has known him. That represents false believers. So these are the reasons why a passage of study can be described as a passage of stark contrast. We see opposite extremes in this passage. One who is perfect and someone who is sin. One who is a true believer and one who is not. Well, having just whetted your spiritual appetite, please allow me to give you a concise overview of how the Holy Spirit has prepared me to present to you his message in our passage of study from start to finish. First of all, we will examine what the Bible teaches about the practice of sin as discussed in verse 4. What does the Bible mean by the statement, everyone who practices sin? How does the Bible define sin? If your granddaughter were to ask you, or grandson, what is sin? What would you tell him? Where would you look to to answer that question? Well, with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures, we will answer these questions in a moment. Second, we will emphasize what the Bible discloses about the purpose for Christ's first appearance as defined in verse 5a. Guided by the Holy Spirit, John gives the recipients of his letter a concise and concrete reason for Christ's first appearance in human history here on our planet. What, what, what is that reason? What should be our most fitting response to the person and work of Christ at his first appearance here on planet Earth? Was John fond of speaking about the divine purpose for Christ's first coming? Well, keep listening attentively in order to, not to miss out on what the Holy Spirit will be saying to us on these very issues. Well, third, we will expound what the Bible reveals about the perfection of Christ as de described to us in verse 5b. Briefly, listen, but brilliantly, the Bible speaks of the perfection of Christ. In a very few but, but word, in a very few words but full of meaning, the Bible confidently and convincingly tells us that Jesus is the perfect sinless one. 
In other words, the one who died on a cross was not just an ordinary person. He is altogether distinct. No one like him ever walked on our planet. And may I say to us, the Lord Jesus Christ is in a distinguished class all by himself. And fourth, we will explore what the Bible tells us about the prevailing habits of a true believer and an unbeliever as depicted in verse 6. At first glance, verse 6 seems problematic perplexing, puzzling, and even paradoxical. It raises serious questions such as, is this verse teaching us the possibility of sinlessness in the present experience of the believer in Jesus Christ? Is this verse the basis of support for those who entertain dreams of perfection in the flesh? That they, some people can tell us that they are perfect. They can't sin anymore. They are just, they've just arrived. Is this verse also a, contra a contradiction of what has been already taught in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, where he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and do not practice the truth. Although his truth is not in us. And then chapter 1, verse 10, it says, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. So, is this chapter 3, verse 6, a contradiction to those verses? Well, with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures, we will address these questions, serious questions, in the course of our study today. Well, having just given you a brief overview, of our passage of study, let's now dig deeper into it to discover the pressures and the practical lessons the Holy Spirit is so eager and enthused to impress upon our hearts in order to do what? A special and specific work of molding and making us, that is genuine born again believers, more into the image of Jesus Christ, who is our shepherd, who is our savior, who is our stronghold, who is our support, who is our strength, and who is our sustainer and security in this present life and in the life soon to come. So we begin first of all by examining what the Bible teaches about the practice of sin as discussed in verse 4. Will you please listen again to what the Bible says in verse 4. It says what? Everyone who practices sin also practices what? Lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Literally, this verse reads, everyone doing sin, doing sin, also lawlessness does. And sin is lawlessness. The Greek verb translated practices comes from poieo. It also means commit. So some of you have everyone who commits sin. And it also means that. So you may have everyone who does sin. It is in the present participle form, poie on. But you ask, what is the significance of that? Well, please listen carefully. It presents, the significance is this. It presents the idea of sinning, listen, not can only continually, but also completely as possible. It expresses continual behavior of doing sin. It conveys the idea of making sin a habitual practice. It speaks of someone who lives continually and habitually in sin. It describes a person who is, who is committing sin on a permanent, customary basis. Such a person is a worker or maker of sin. He's a, he or she is a habitual or customary sinner who sins deliberately. This is the person the Bible is describing. Describing. You know people like that, and I know people like that. They live continually in sin. They talk continually about sin. <clears throat> and they live, their lives are lived in an ongoing sin. 
one after the other, day in and day out. And that is what they call living. They are living in sin, but they call it living. You see, friends, there is a huge difference between committing a sin, committing a sin, and continuing in sin. Even the most faithful Christians sometimes commit sins, but they do not cherish a particular sin or continually or deliberately choose to commit it. I hope most of you here who are believers are not people who choose deliberately to sin when you wake up. Well, today I'm choosing deliberately to sin against God. I don't think any one of us here has that mentality. Well, because we have Christ in us. A true Christ follower who commits a sin can repent, confess it, and find full forgiveness in Christ Jesus. A person who continues to sin, by contrast, does not express genuine and godly sorrow for doing what is wrong in the sight of God. As such, this person never confesses and never receives God's free and full forgiveness. This is because such a person is in opposition to God, no matter what religious claims he or she makes. So please, I want us to understand this. I want to make this very clear to us. Although true believers and followers of Christ have a sin disposition, we have the old nature still living in us. And we do commit sin and do commit sin. That is not the unbroken pattern of their lives. A genuinely born again believer has a built in check or guard against habitual sinning due to a new nature in him or her. So the Bible is not speaking here of a person, of a believer. Because a believer, by reason of being conformed to Christ, cannot continue habitually, deliberately living in sin. Now, will you please notice how the Bible defines sin for us? So here's the question. How does the Bible define sin for us? Well, the Bible uses two words to describe sin. Hamatian and Anomian. Sin, Hamatia, was used to describe the transgression of the law, the breaking of the commandments of God. It is the deliberate breaking of a law which a man well knows. You, you only break a, something that you know. If I don't know something, I can't tell I'm breaking a law or not. So whenever you break something you know <laughs> well, that is sin. Sin is to obey oneself rather than obey God. It is insubordination to God, wanting one's own way, and refusing to acknowledge the Lord as rightful sovereign. In essence, listen, sin is placing one's will above the will of God. It is opposition to a living person who has the right to be obeyed, says William MacDonald. In other words, sin is basically and fundamentally that which is contrary to the will of God. Anything I do that is contrary to God's will for my life is sin. A little girl was asked in Sunday school to give her definition of what sin is. And this is what she said. She said, I think sin is anything that you like to do. You know, she wasn't far from the truth because the old nature, that is the you, the old nature in us that we have is absolutely contrary to the will of God. It always wants its own way. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have all turned to our 
own way. But he says, we have turned every one of us to his own way. Or to her own way, if we make it in that sense. The phrase, his own way, is your problem and my problem. <laughs> we all want to have our own way. That is what our old nature wants. To have its own way, not God's way. And that, my friends, is what is called sin. To have my own way, not God's way. Well, the second word used to define sin is lawlessness, anomia. Lawlessness defined sin as rebellion against God and was connected with Satan's rebellion against God. It conveys more than transgressing God's law. It conveys the ultimate sense of rebellion, that is, living as if there was no law, listen, or ignoring what laws exist. It is activity bereft of God's guidance in violation of his law. And that's how many people are living today. They live ignoring the voice of God. And that was how the opponents of the gospel of Jesus Christ lived in the days of John. And their lawlessness coupled with their lack of love show that they do not belong to God but to the devil. As we'll see, see God willing next week, we'll go to a, a very, a very, a very powerful passage that will tell us things in black and white. It says, you are either a child of God or you are either a child of the devil. And that's not me who is saying it. It's John the Apostle who was given that revelation before he passed into eternity. So the Bible makes it clear here in Romans chapter 4 that before the law was given, there was sin, but it wasn't called transgression. In Romans chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there, is also, there also is no violation. And then in Romans chapter 5, verse 12 to 14, the Bible also speaks about this matter. It says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Moses was when the law was given. So before that, there was no law. Even over those who had not sin in the likeness of the sins of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So the sin was in the world ruling and reigning as king between the time of Adam and Moses. But that was before God's law was given to Moses. So the King James Version that translates that sin is the transgression of the law is not entirely accurate. You see, man was still a sinner and insubordinate to God. Nevertheless, it was not transgression of the law because the law hadn't been given at that time. So to sum up, sin is having your own way and lawlessness, listen, is living as if there is no law. For the believer, lawlessness is incompatible with with uh, being born of God. And the Christian cannot habitually, continually, deliberately practice sin because that is not his nature. Well, having examined what the Bible teaches about the practice of sin, as discussed in verse 4, the Bible now brings us to the point of emphasizing what it discloses about the purpose of Christ's first coming or first appearance as defined in verse 5a. You see, John knew that God is what? A God of purpose. He has a purpose 
for everything he does in your life and my life. Sometimes it's hard for us to understand why God is letting us go through certain things. Like two weeks ago, I had a whole week of an attack on me. And I had to stay up night after night praying. I'm like, Lord, what is all this about? I still don't know what it is. But I know that he was there taking me through it. He has a purpose for it. Maybe one day he will reveal it to me. But for now, I just need to trust him. And the same with you. When times, sometimes you are going through something and you don't understand why God is doing it, well, you still have the choice to keep trusting him until he chooses to say, this is why I allow this in your life. So guided by the Holy Spirit, John now gives the believers of his day a concise and concrete reason for Christ's first coming into our world. Would you please listen carefully to what the Bible says in verse 5a, the first part of, part of verse 5, he says, you know, he's talking to them, you know that he appeared to take away sins. Literally this re reads, and you know that that one, referring to Jesus, was manifested in order that sins he might bear. You see, under the Old Testament sacrifice system, a lamb without blemish was offered as a sacrifice for sin. And may I say to us, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Only the Lord Jesus can take away sin. I haven't heard of any other person who successfully took away sin. All I know is that Jesus alone is the one who takes away sin. He came for that purpose. And he bore the penalty of your sin and my sin. He broke the power of sin over your life and over my life. And one day soon, Jesus will banish the presence of sin in your life and my life. One of the, when I pray or fast, one of the things I like to do is to use the letters of the alphabet. And when I came, when I come to the letter N, I use the letters of the alphabet to praise God. So A like advocate, like we saw in John, 1 John chapter uh, 2. Or a B like uh, the bridegroom or the builder of the church. So when I come to N, <laughs> one of the ways I praise Jesus is that I'm looking for the day of no longer sinning against you. I can't wait for that day because every day you wake up, even as I'm praying, some thoughts that are sinful can invade my, my, my mind. And I have to say, no, I can't take you in. But there is a day coming when Jesus will banish the presence of sin from your life and from my life. So you see, friends and fellow believers, a true follower of Christ cannot go on practicing sin. Why? Because that would be a complete denial of the purpose for which the Lord Jesus came into the world at the first Christmas. It would be incompatible with the work of Christ. Jesus died to set apart the believer, to go on and sin, Therefore, is to live in utter disregard of the reason for his incarnation. That is God becoming man and taking upon us, upon himself, our sin, debt, and paid it in full. Jesus came and died willingly on the cross, not only so that sin might be forgiven you and me, but also that it might cease to exercise its tyrannical bondage over your life and my life. In other words, to sin is, to, is, is contrary to Christ's work of breaking the dominion of sin in the believer's life. So the question is, what should be our most fitting response to the person and work of Christ at his first appearance? Should not our hearts be filled with continual praise and gratitude for all that 
God has graciously done for us in Christ Jesus, sin, he says, is lawlessness. But the good news is that Jesus Christ appeared in history in order to remove it, in order to take it away, so that you and I can be free from the bondage and the tyranny of sin in our lives. Actually, John was fond of speaking about the divine purpose for Christ's coming. Every time he writes, he says, this is the reason, this is the purpose why Jesus came the first time. In a few verses from here, he will speak of another purpose for, of, uh, for Jesus' first coming. In John chapter 3, verse 8, he writes, the Son of God appeared for this purpose. What purpose? That he might destroy the works of the devil. We'll look at that in our next message. God will it. He will add three more in 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. Uh, verse 9 and 10. And verse 14, he says in verse 9, By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. One purpose for Jesus' is coming is for you and me to live through Jesus. Then verse 10, he says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So he tells us why Jesus came again to be the propitiation, the satisfactory, satisfactory sacrifice for our sins. And then in verse 14, he says, we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. I love that. That is one of the greatest verses of Scripture. Jesus has been sent as the Son of the Father to be the Savior of the world. He wants to save people from Iraq, Indonesia, India, China, Canada, Name it Aruba, Argentina, Brazil, Bermuda. He wants to be what? The savior of the world. People from those places will be at the throne of God. So John's point is well taken. John delights in speaking about the divine purpose of Christ's first coming. Embracing these purposes will enhance our worship and our gratitude, and our adoration, and admiration, and of course our appreciation for all that God has graciously, generously, gloriously, genuinely, and greatly done for us in His Son, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, having examined what the Bible teaches about the practice of sin in verse 4, and having also emphasized what it discloses to us, about the purpose of Christ's first coming in verse 5a, the Bible now brings us to the point of expounding on what it reveals about the perfection of Christ as described in verse 5b. In a very few words full of meaning, the Bible confidently and convincingly tells us that Jesus is indeed the perfect sinless one. And that is why the Bible says in the, the last part of verse 5, and in him, in him, there is no sin. Literally, this reads, and sin in him is not. Is not. To say, and sin in him is not, is a reminder that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. We saw that earlier in chapter 1. Earlier, First John gloriously speaks of the purity of the divine Son of God. That is why I recited the whole beginning from chapter 1, uh, chapter, verse 1, verse, verse 1 of chapter 3, because chapter 3, verse 3 tells us Jesus is pure. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as what? He is pure. So first, the Bible speaks of the purity of Jesus. Now, it glowingly speaks of the perfection of the Christ. I tell you, friends, Jesus is altogether sinless. Is the embodiment of sinlessness. He's in a distinguished class all by himself. Notice the Bible uses the present tense, and sin in him 
is not. This is to emphasize that sinlessness is characteristic of Jesus' eternal nature. Jesus was sinless in his pre-existence, in his life in the flesh, and in his eternal position as the divine son of, son of God. In other words, there was never a time in Jesus' life whereby he practiced sin or was polluted by sin. I, <laughs> there are many times where I have practiced sin and have been polluted by sin. But that is never the case for Jesus Christ. There was never a time in his life like that. He was without spot or blemish. As was the Leviticus sin offering. No one like him ever walked on our planet. Not only was he perfect, but he also lived a perfect life and willingly and wholeheartedly sacrificed himself for our sins, all of them, past, present, and future. As such, we can be completely forgiven. We can look back to his death on the cross for us and know that we need never suffer eternal death. That is eternal separation from the presence of the loving Father. Please listen, because Jesus is pure, because Jesus is perfect and lived a pure and perfect life, he is able to remove the guilt of our sins and to provide the power to rescue us from the habit of sin. How wonderful is Jesus my Savior. Bible commentator William MacDonald shares this brief and brilliant insight on the words, in him there is no sin. Quote, this is one of the three key passages in the New Testament dealing with the sinless humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter tells us he did no sin. First Peter chapter 2 verse 22. Paul tells us that he knew no sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Now John, the disciple, who, who, who knew the Lord in an especially intimate way, has his testimony, in him is no sin, unquote. It is this Jesus who is not only pure and perfect, but also powerful and preeminent, who died on the cross to pay our sin debt in full. The perfect one, is our perfect plea. This reminds me of the hymn writer's words, Frederick Whitefield and his hymn, Oh How I Love Jesus. The first and, first and second stanza said, There is a name I love to hear. I love to say, sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. The second verse says, it tells me of a savior, a, a savior's love, who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. May that be our song as we ponder the Jesus' perfection and for being God's perfect sacrifice and our perfect plea before God. And now having examined what the Bible teaches about the practice of sin and what sin is in verse 4 and having also emphasized what it reveals as the purpose of God's, of Christ's first coming or first appearance in verse 5a and having also expounded on what it discloses to us about the perfection of Christ in verse 5b, now the Bible brings our message to an end by exploring what it tells us about what? The prevailing habits of a true believer and an unbeliever as depicted in verse 6. So would you please once again listen to what the Bible says in verse 6 as we wrap this message up. It says what? No one who abides in him, who? Jesus, sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Literally, 
the Spirit, everyone remaining in him sins not. Everyone sinning has not seen him, nor has known him. For sure, at first glance, this verse seems problematic, perplexing, and paradoxical. It raises serious questions, as I said before, such as, is, is it teaching the possibility of sinlessness in the present experience of the believer in Jesus Christ? Is it the basis of support for those who entertain the dream, dreams of perfection in the flesh? Or is it con contradictory to what we have already learned in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 10? Well, please listen, the Bible is not asserting sinless perfection in the Christian's life. In other words, it is not teaching the possibility of sinlessness in the present experience of the believer in Jesus Christ. If you come to that point, you will not be here. <laughs> you know that, and I know that. As such, it is not contradictory to what has been taught earlier in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 10. You see, this verse, listen carefully, contrasts the prevailing habits of the true believer in Jesus Christ with one who has never been born again. The divine life and the life of sin are in idea mutually exclusive. Two important verbs help us see that, that today, namely abides, menon, and sins, hamatanon, hamatanon. You notice that both verbs are in the present tense, specifically in the per present participle, and indicate the habitual character of a person. So the person who is, listen, who is abiding or remaining or continuing in Christ is not able to sin habitually. That is what the Bible is saying. In other words, true followers of Jesus Christ do not recklessly, rashly, or carelessly, continuously, or characteristically, or habitually continue to violate God's word or the anointing that they have received, which, which is planted within them. Oh yes, sin may enter their experience, but it is the exception and not the rule. So the Bible is teaching us here that the believer who is abiding in Christ does not go on living in sin. That is not the prevailing habit of his or hers. Because that person has a new nature in him or her. When a Christian does sin, which we all do, he or she is convicted by the Holy Spirit, comes to the Father humbly, confesses his or her sin to the Father, and then continues in his or her purification. Like the prodigal son, son true belief, the true believer may leave the father's house and wallow in the pig pen of sin. But he or she will not live in the pig pen forever. Remember the prodigal son. He didn't stay in the pig pen forever. At some point, he came to his senses and said, let me go back to my father's house. So the believer comes to his or her senses and returns to the father's house. You see, a true believer will never be content in a sinful state. He will not be happy or she will not be happy in sin. If you are someone who is happy in sin, then there is a big question mark about your born again experience. It may not be true. You may just have had an emotional experience. The genuine believer, believer's life is characterized not by sin, but by doing what is right. On the other hand, if sin is the ruling principle of a life, the Bible says that that person is not regenerated or saved. In other words, the continuous sinner has not known God and is therefore an unregenerate person. He or she is marked by habitual constant sin. That is her life or his life. A, person can, a person's continual or habitual life of sin makes it crystal clear that he or she 
has never had his eyes or her eyes open, spiritually open, and has not come to know Jesus Christ. So that is to say, if no check against habitual sin exists in someone who professes to be a Christian, John says, this is clear, this is absolutely clear, that that person has never been saved. Now, important question arises at this juncture. When, when does sin become habitual? I want to know that. When does sin in my life become habitual? How often does a person have to commit it for it to become characteristic behavior? Well, John does not answer this question for you and for me. Rather, he puts each believer on guard and leaves the burden of proof on the Christian himself. In other words, the believer is warned that his or her failure to abide in Christ will result in committing sin. So you see how important abiding in Christ is to the believer. As you and I, in reliance upon the Holy Spirit, abides or remains or continues in Christ, the Bible tells us God provides the power to deliver us from the habit of sinning and to overcome sin in our lives. So this brings us to where we, we started. The chief reason for Christ's first coming is to deal decisively with our sin problem so that true believers will become what? Overcomers of sin by remaining in him. So how does this message apply to you and to me today? Well, if you are already a genuine born-again believer in Jesus Christ, this is how the Holy Spirit wants to apply it to your life and to my life. First of all, realize that there is, listen, there is a huge difference between committing a sin and continuing in sin habitually. When you commit an act of sin as a believer in Jesus Christ, it does not mean you have lost your salvation. I know some of you have been told that before. All you have to do is to confess that particular sin and count on God's forgiveness. And then you move on. Second, remember that Jesus' purpose for coming to earth the first time is to take away your sins and mine. He dealt with our sin problem once and for all on the cross. And then third, rely on the Holy Spirit to adore, admire, appreciate Christ for all he has done for you and will do for you to the day of eternity. And then fourth, remain in him. Why? Because as you remain in him, he will provide you the power to overcome sin in your life. And the same thing applies to me. Now, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, may I humbly say to you today, your life is marked by sin, and you cannot overcome sin in your own power, let alone free yourself from sin's tyrannical, tyrannical bondage over your life. In your state of unbelief, you are actually a slave of sin, or a slave of self, doing things your own way, a slave of sin, obeying yourself rather than God, and you are a slave of Satan, who has come to steal and kill and destroy. But all that can change for you today. How or why? Because God loves you and wants his very best for you, not only in this life, but also in the life soon to come. He's giving you a wonderful opportunity to be forgiven of all your sins and to be brought into his family today. So you simply come to Jesus just as you are. You confess to Jesus today that you are a sinner and that you cannot deal with your sin problem, but he can deal with your sin problem and free you from, your, from his tyranny. And then you call on Jesus with what? Simple, sincere, childlike faith that he died on that cross for your sins and that he was buried to put away your sins and that he rose again from the dead on that third day to bring you into a right standing with God. And the Bible says you'll be what? born again, and you'll be a new creature in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we commit this message to you today. It is a difficult message, but I thank you, Father God, for giving us the 